a lot of people uh, are really looking to work, work their way into in the in the pro and the high competitive, uh, high performance environments. So this one, a lot of statisticians are really working towards this this whole neural networks approach, especially for performance metrics in um, professional sports. You see a lot of NHL teams working their way into it. It's been big in baseball for a while. And it's only been a matter of time really since they start pairing this stuff with the biometrics data that we've been collecting for some time now. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to really dig into and take a good hard look at the biometrics when it's something that really hasn't been um, as in depth in terms of discovery and hasn't had uh, some real, some real hammered down research topics. Of course, you'll see later in this presentation, there are some numbers like the acute chronic ratio, strain and monotony, and then the fatigue and fitness model that make an attempt, but as we start to talk about it, we might realize that they might be undue um, as environments change and adaptations are realized. So without further ado, we'll go right into it. And starting off, we could talk about the what exactly a neural network entails. So a neural network, it's a deep learning um, tool, machine learning activity that a lot of statisticians and data scientists are starting to use today. It's based off the model of the human brain. So there's these nodes or neurons, for our sake, we'll call them inputs today, that make connections at edges or synapses. These synapses give specific outcomes. So for example, um, if you're looking into neural networks in the real estate department, it might be something along the tune of, you know, average income of an area where you're looking to buy property, the crime rate, um, and then also, you know, hospitals in the nearest, you know, X amount of distance, schools, things of that nature. But for our all intents and purposes, what we're looking at is obviously our biometrics, our internal or external loads, and how those create these environments that will indirectly or directly, which we'll come to see, affect performance outcomes and recovery variables throughout the course of a competitive season. Uh, is anyone having problems here seeing my screen? I hope, uh, I hope that's not the case. But if not, then we'll be sure to get the recording over to um, having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Anyhow, so how neural networks work, and this is just a brief overview. So looking at why is our output single, signal? So for us, this might be fatigue um, over the course of a long season. With Y being the output, output and X the input variables, one of the many input variables, we assign certain weights to these inputs. Um, so for instance, if we're looking at sleep might have a heavier weight than say number of recovery sessions or uh, hydration levels throughout a season. And then N being the number of those input variables themselves. So those would be in a larger, more vast neural network uh, where you have a large number of inputs, you're expected to have a little bit easier of a time predicting the Y, predicting the output variables. Uh, the sum of each weighted output is then going to be what represents the outcome signal. Now, the signals are not always totally accurate, as we'll come to see. And we have some measurements for that, some residuals and hysteresis that will give us a look at, you know, how exactly accurate is our neural network itself. For today's discussion, we're going to look at determining our input variables based off what's available to us. So in my environment, we've been using uh, internal load monitoring using a stress questionnaire app of Fit for 90 that, you know, it makes it really easy. It's no different than any Google Sheets platform you're going to use. It's no different than any, um, really any stress questionnaire that you're going to have. Uh, one thing that makes it really easy is its accessibility, uh, the ability to send out, you know, your reminders automatically, and then also as as we'll see some some charts that the athlete is able to get access to and helps with their adherence to it. For external load, we use player tech. It's uh, the cheaper version of Catapult. 
It's the way I like to put it. It's got the IMU GPS uh, combo. So it gets pretty much all the same metrics that we're going to be looking at with a Catapult S5. Pairing those two together will whittle down what what really gets important to us in our in this particular environment of soccer. Um, for external load GPS stuff, I really only adhere to a few metrics that's going to be distance, sprint distance, and then an acceleration deceleration ratio, which I use myself uh, with a threshold of over three meters per second squared. So some pretty intense accelerations, decelerations. It's another way to look at the IMU uh, or the IMA, sorry, and kind of get your positional demands. For wellness, the only things that we're going to whittle out would be our sleep quantity and quality, those two separate metrics, fatigue, stress, and soreness. Um, a couple of things that we've been able to really hammer down this season and have found some pretty promising results in looking at those correlations there. Uh, so taking a look here at the bigger picture of things, we know that our internal loads and our external loads directly or indirectly adhere to and will influence our wellness and fatigue throughout the season. Something that we try and stay on top of, especially in our environment, college soccer, where we might even wind up playing two to three games a week, keeping guys fresh and ready for their next bout, high intensity bout is real important, especially with a high pressing team like we have. It's high intensity a lot of the time, very low, uh, very high, sorry, work to rest ratios, uh, cause we're constantly pushing the ball and pushing the pace of the game. So what we need to look at here is how can we produce a model that might be predictive of this wellness and fatigue based on the demands of practice and the game through internal and external loads. Are there any pre-existing frameworks that add context to that data? You know, like I said, your fatigue fitness or your acute chronics that might actually give you some inkling of best of how to determine best practices in doing so. Of the available data, is there any confounding inputs that may provide insight into protective or detrimental inputs? So again, it's all about assigning the weights. So are there any things that, you know, we can really focus on knowing that our next available option, if we're not, you know, putting the time and effort into that, we're not missing out on any of the why, the outcome variables that we're really trying to attack. So in order to do that, you really got to take a deeper look. Um, and start to unveil these hidden layers. So that's a big topic in the neural networks is the hidden layers. And many, many um, different models surmise from that. And depending on what outputs you're trying to look at will tell you how many hidden layers you may actually have. So basically what the hidden layer does is if you have X input and you're trying to get Y output, you know that there are these protective variables or maybe um, destructive variables in the way between that. So if I'm looking at per se soreness, right, as my output variable, I know I have a few protective variables in, in between the way. I have my hydration, my sleep quality, and those things add into that hidden layer if my input would then be what determines the soreness. So my external load, um, maybe my training volume per week, tonnage, whatever calculations you're doing there. Uh, so what's really interesting about this is, you know, it gets away from the whole idea of fixed values and linear regressions or, you know, your, your Pearson's R and those other things that you might look at in order to determine where you're going in terms of soreness. And it kind of allows you to take into consideration that the human body really doesn't adapt to stress linearly. Adding multiple layers will kind of give you that idea that, you know, there are many confounding variables and many protective effects that you can implement or take away from in order to keep those, those hidden layers kind of at bay and get you your better output. So two methods for analysis in your, uh, in your neural network. First of which we just touched on would be that linear regression. It's the most simple predictive measure of casual relationships. You can calculate your Pearson's R or your R squared P value to determine whether your correlation is significant or simply due to chance. Something that we're going to see a lot of 
when you go back retrospectively is things that you may thought of had a casual relationship in the beginning of season might not adhere to or might not hold true towards the end. And that's going to be where that P value comes into play in determining, you know, as your sample size grows, as that N gets larger, whether or not these things are significant. Using your regression to predict your outcome falls under that category of machine learning. So machine learning, most simply put, is just the idea that you can take all these samples that you get, filter them through either your linear or your logistic regression, which we'll talk about in a second. And from that and your past experiences, you can build on and predict these outcome variables. Now for us, multiple regression analysis is gonna be what we're really gonna dig into a little bit because multiple regression analysis allows you to do this for multiple variables. So when we talked about having more than one input um, on the previous slide, we're really talking about you know the multiple stressors that the athlete might experience throughout that season. Using a multiple regression analysis takes away, almost makes these nonlinear relationships seem linear, right? So you know that if your sleep quality and your sleep quantity are highly related, but sleep quality is the only one that seems to have a statistically significant casual relationship to soreness. Well, you know that the sleep quantity is also playing into that. That's where that, you know, one way ANOVA or your multiple regression analysis is going to help you determine those problems. Your, log your logistic regression, sorry, I'm losing my voice again here. Your logistic aggression is really only good for that binary data, that ones and zeros, you know, your yeses and nos. And as we know, many of these biometrics are often not binary. There are things like, you know, sliding scales for fatigue, your trimp values, and other things that come into play here that vary so much on an individual basis and very second to second, and even in these minute uh, measures, that's really hard to put a black and white value on those. However, you can take those sliding scales, you can take some biometrics and make them binary. So for instance, you know, you can go through your data and look at, you know, set your arbitrary threshold, say, you know, eight hours of sleep is acceptable amongst your team. Well, if you didn't get eight hours of sleep, your binary data would become a zero. If you did or got more, it might be a one. But in doing so, you now know that past that, say, nine and a half, 10 hour threshold, where you have already gone through your quality sleep, your REM, you're now looking at and scoring oversleeping the same way that you would sleeping an adequate amount. So that's where that logistic regression model really starts to become flawed when we're looking at something like the human body. So it can be beneficial when you're working with discrete data, things that are um, absolute and or black and white, but it really becomes hard when you're looking at something like biometrics, heart rate, internal load, or external load. So taking a look back at some of our season data, and now this would only be the first 11 weeks of training, including our preseason here. We, uh, we kind of went back and had to take a look mid-season to see if what we're doing and what we're trying to assess is really making all that difference. So I went through and took a look at fatigue. Fatigue is huge here in our environment, obviously, because we have at West Point the academics of an Ivy with you know, the sporting requirements of any other division one. So we really got to make sure that our short practice times are optimal. And in order to do that, in order to maximize that motor learning, in order to make sure that, you know, we're adhering to um, the times that we're allotted through the military, fatigue becomes huge. So with that, we know that when, um, we know that when sleep quantity sleep quality becomes low it's it's really hard for us to go through and it's really hard to get any sort of um sorry any sort of benefit out of that short amount of time that we're allotted right but 
if we go through and we get and we get our linear our multiple regression analysis and we can see that you know based upon these near 2000 samples at that 11 week period from all our athletes we know that we can actually kind of determine where we're going to have to work around this amassment of fatigue and where we can actually start to push our guys so what we have here in this gray ab line is our predicted values right so this is where we can look at you know these things vary up and down but where do our neural networks stand to predict that increase in fatigue or that observed fatigue value so that difference there would be our residual and the residual is displayed here in red and our predicted values in blue so knowing that our stress questionnaire is on a six point scale sorry seven point scale with three positive points three negative points and a zero our positive values represent that underestimate of fatigue when it comes to the residual and our negative values represent an overestimate so it's really really easy to take these these numbers this sleep quality and quantity and when those are low or off it's really easy to say well our guys are going to be fatigued but when they're off and our guys aren't fatigued you know when you have those days where you sleep say sub six hours and you wake up still feeling fresh that's where it becomes really hard for this predictive model to come into play so even with this large sample size and this level of significance this model had difficulties in predicting fatigue 55 percent of overestimates were above levels deemed significant so that's a huge number right so that means over the course of those 11 11 weeks of our sample size of about 30 guys 55 percent of the times where our model said hey these guys are going to be canned they were actually all right and ready to go outside of the predicted uh, outside of the predicted range here this ab line now there was still a whole 900 other instances inside that ab line where the model was pretty correct and you can see that here but trying to understand where that other 55 percent lies is where it really gets difficult so that that's kind of where this texas sharpshooter fallacy comes into play so it often occurs with large data sets multiple categories and multiple covariates like we get here in sports science when a practitioner aims to find the correlation of that one subset try and find that one value that tells the whole story that's where a lot of confounding variables get ignored if you focus on only those similarities and those things that lead you to the, your conclusion then you're more than likely to come to a false conclusion um this is just comes back to this this fallacy this texas sharpshooter story where you know if i'm if I'm a sharpshooter, I don't go up to a wall to start blasting holes in it and then determine where I'm going to paint targets. You have to have your predetermined KPIs, your predetermined uh, interventions that you're going to look at before you really start to dig and think about what types of things you can make, make inferences on. Humans seek patterns by nature, and this is what this machine learning is trying to do. It takes this approach to sports science with knowledge of your biases and your fallacies, and you can start to bulletproof your arguments. So by doing so, taking a look back at our, our uh, fatigues values, we can look at our, our team as its own isolated uh, environment, right? We can use a percent rank amongst that team or any other normative statistics i prefer percent ranks to determine where okay these are our high guys these are our low guys these guys were percent ranked out by soreness and fatigue to see which comes together and determines you know where they lay at on that linear regression model 
Now it gets really interesting here because our positive ranks obviously correlate to lower magnitudes of soreness and fatigue. So keep that in mind. That's why we have our green guys up here on the right and our red guys down in that bottom left corner. The highest reporters of soreness in this model are the ones that coincidentally were the three highest reporters of stress. They had the type A personality, right? So these guys actually were in that fight or flight mode all the time. And aside from that, when they're with their type A personality in our context and environment, they are actually the type to go home after practice and be sure that they're up on their studies, not the guys that will that fall asleep or put things off, you know, in season. Of the five at the top, um, 75th to 100th percentile rank here, are those guys that were also in the top 10 for sleep quantity. Now, maybe that means they're skipping out on homework when they go home, or maybe that's because they take their recovery seriously. But most interestingly, amongst these athletes with the lowest residual, they tend to be non-starters or freshmen. So the predictive model is really good at, you know, telling us where these people who are just getting introduced to this stressor, these freshmen or non-starters are going to lie, but it has a harder time when we look at our two reporters of soreness with the nonlinear increase, those top two red numbers there, the type A personality guys we talked about, has a really hard time delineating between their subjective experiences that have led them to be able to withstand that types of soreness and report lower levels of fatigue. So this is where it really comes into play, knowing your, knowing your team and knowing your athletes. When my guys, you know, like we talked about before, we have the academics of an Ivy with the demands of any other division one school. Um, <clears throat> that's why, you know, these guys can report relatively normal levels of fatigue, but still, or that central fatigue, but still be going through that peripheral, you know, muscle soreness that we'll get from those long practice sessions. They've adapted to that over the course of their four years. It's really nothing new to them. It's the freshmen and the non-starters or transfers and non-responders that really are the ones that are susceptible to this fatigue ability. This multiple reg regression analysis obviously was a lot stronger than our last one when we look at soreness and stress as influence on fatigue because of that reason itself. I believe, you know, that their fatigue fitness model has really been built up over the course of their four years being here to the point where they're actually able to grind through those, those long seasons and that increased um, demand and training load on the body. So that's a hard thing to really try and try and calculate and put out into your neural network, into your multiple regressions. And, you know, the better you can be for it, then the better off you will be in the long run. So nonlinear adaptation and variability and demand is, is something that you might see throughout the course of your season, right? So that's the beauty of using your multiple regressions at multiple points or you know, kind of looking at this complex system and neural network model is you understand that no two samples are the same, right? And variability in weekly practice load and game tactics happens day to day, week to week. You know, other models are kind of built off this, this static environment that doesn't change with the athlete, with the upcoming game and with the upcoming, you know, or with the change in practice plans. But nearing, nearing midpoint of season where increases in game density happen, that's where we start to, started to see our environment really start to change, right? So our sprint distance by week goes up because our games get closer together and our guys need to hit their shape and hit their you know, passing patterns midweek, preparing for another game, as opposed to laying it off by two days. So we saw, you know, at, up here in the left, up here in the right, sorry, their subjective soreness score kind of drop below that smallest worthwhile change and then come back up as they, they adapted to it weeks five through seven, right? You know, this is what happens as the season goes on. It's an initial shock, like you're jumping into a cold stream, but then you start to get used to it. You start to warm up. 
it's, it's no different when it comes to accumulated stress. But what happens where it dips back below into that predicted range that under that positive smallest worthwhile change is you see here in our sprint distance by week started to go up. And that's when we started to play more games per week. We started to practice harder when we could and density increases. So now we have a new environment. Now we have new demands um, or possibly similar demands, just less spread apart with less time for adaptation and recovery. So uh, here's what our normal um, progression would look like. And by no means am I saying that this is, you know, the optimal one, but this is kind of what we are able to get done in our environment and what our coach adheres to. So with our game day minus three, we go ahead and we increase the size of that field, bigger play and passing patterns, try and space our guys out, push the pace a little bit. So we'll get that larger acceleration and deceleration ratio when it comes to external load. And we'll have a higher high speed sprint distance. I mean, that's just common sense, right? When you have, those longer distances to really get up to top speed and get out and go. With our internal load, you'll have a moderate to high session RP. Um, of course, that's duration times intensity, so your training load. You'll have a high work to rest ratio, meaning higher on the, the, the work side of things, less rest intervals, but the intensity of those actual drills might be a little bit lower. So although, you know, we really are getting up to speed here, the intensity of that drill, meaning, you know, the player load and the small area change of direction is low compared to that of the game. Now that of practice, this is where we kind of get after them a little bit because we know we have that opportunity. Game day minus two is typically where, you know, we might play a little small side to decrease size of the field smaller play with a little bit more finishing so a little more anterior dominant hip flexor stuff going on there um ex external load wise it's a smaller acceleration and deceleration ratio so that means just because it's smaller ratio doesn't mean it's smaller um volume right that just means we're on the deceleration side of things that means it's a lot of change of direction a lot of short area quickness things of that nature our high player load comes from that change of direction and that, that short area stuff. Internal load, of course, would be moderate to high. Um, a lot less than you would expect with these guys, being that they're used to that sort of model. Now, our work to rest ratio is low in that, you know, we try and keep quality a little bit higher there. Uh, and then game day minus one, we'll kind of just, cool them down, push out into almost minimal or no stress at all, realistically. Um, longer discussion with players, you know, we work our shape and we talk more about, you know, tactics and a lot lower volume with some finishing in there. The external load is near equal when it comes to that acceleration deceleration ratio, only because that's more natural to what you might see in the game. Sometimes, uh, depending upon position, you might have that higher, higher deceleration ratio if you play a lot in the middle of the field. Uh, distance is, is relatively low. Um, distance above a certain threshold. There's a lot of walking, a lot of time on feet here, but that all you know, gets filtered through in our system and we don't account for that. But it is worth noting. Um, <clears throat> our internal load would be low to moderate at moderate would be pushing it to be honest and the rp or actual intensity rating of intensity would not be high at all either um as you can see these are kind of the the trends that we'll get from the guys the day after when they report their soreness so obviously get game day minus three we have those those higher intensity sprints we see a lot of calves and hamstrings just to the point where they're feeling them nothing too intense um initially maybe in the season a lot more intense but once they start to get adapted to those stressors it kind of evens itself out and game day minus two where we we get into that change of direction um we're obviously going to have a lot more soreness in the quads due to deceleration uh especially with our more twitchy guys our type two fiber guys and game day minus one that 
that soreness does carry over. Not so much with the hamstrings. You'll find those will often be like a like a flash and, and it's gone. But with the quadriceps and that that type two fiber, it really starts to uh, linger around a little bit more, especially with our guys. So game day plus one. This would be obviously the day after a game. This is where our wellness stuff really comes into play. It's position dependent when we look at the GPS for acceleration and deceleration ratio, but that'll often determine, you know, where these guys really start to report their, their highest levels of soreness. Uh, typically higher uh, for the attacking mids and forwards, meaning that they will go to goal and do a little more finishing. So we do get up in that acceleration ratio and holding mids uh, in the back line. Those guys have a little more, little more uh, change of direction in our model. If we're running four four two diamond, which basically just means you know they'll rotate through and then kind of be a little bit more present in the defense, and that's where you see a lot of those quadriceps get reported and a lot of that eccentric, um, you know, muscle damage happens. There's a protective effect of sleep quality, not so much quantity, on the degree of soreness. So. Obviously, like we talked about, this sleep quantity number really gets kind of overplayed, I think, in the literature. And it doesn't matter so much if you're hitting that eight hours if six of it is really suboptimal. So what we've tried to start to do is really push that sleep quality stuff on our guys. Um, it's worth noting that for these, these game day plus ones, you might have a little shorter of a recovery time in women. Um, a couple – reasons that I would posit that would probably be a little bit lower of a BMI or with less impulse. So, you know, mass moves mass, right. And there's less, less to be done when you're actually looking at, you know, a lower center of mass, lower gravity, and a lot less bone mass density to overcome its own inertia. And there's a little more type one fiber. So for them, less force produced, but also, the ability to recover a little bit better from high bouts of fatigue. And obviously the quadriceps dominance, not in the sense that, you know, they're overusing them, but they're more adapted to those high stresses of the quadriceps. Um, compounding density of these game day plus ones is really where things start to get, get hairy in season, right? So <clears throat> it's not so much in terms of wellness, uh, or in terms of, you know, reporting the number of games that are scheduled, but it's so much, you know, the number of game day plus ones that you have, right? Obviously the two go hand in hand, but if they become denser and closer together, if game days become, you know, less quicker turnarounds, then obviously you're going to have increased incidences of soreness, fatigue, and an elevated risk of injury. That's almost common sense. But when it comes to any interventions around that, you really got to look at limiting your time on feet, practice duration, and team obligations because these all negatively impact recovery. Time gets taken away from rest as well as the ability to complete their other needs, especially if you're in the college environment, that's schoolwork, right? So that means for my guys, sleep quantity is going down. And of course, you know, you're up past 2 a.m., like your quality is going to drop off too you're snacking late and you're not going to be able to get to that REM cycle like you should. Um, <clears throat> so these are things to consider when you're looking at opportunity costs there. These shorter practice durations actually yielded better play when we started to, to kind of get in tune with that. It correlated with elevated mood, decreased stress, increases in sleep quality and quantity. So when you don't have – as many things to worry about because you're not on the pitch till 9 p.m. every night, then you don't have that, that, uh, that impending doom, you know, that ex existential dread of, oh, God, I got to go back and do this, right? I got to get back to my dorm so I can do homework while you're trying to practice and add skill late at night. This also obviously frees up some time to increase your sleep quantity and a little bit of quality there obviously comes on the, on the backside of things. So working backwards, understanding that these outputs are really the sum of the inputs. Environments aren't stagnant, so these things change as the season goes on. It's all, it's all about determining what's important and when. Uh, 
and the more seasons you go through, the more samples you get and the easier you can put your athletes into buckets. Like we talked about earlier with our freshmen and our responders and then our non-responders, the more you can start to predict these things starting to happen and you can check your multiple regressions and see where these values really are at. <clears throat> so this is why absolute values and quantities may not be as telling as individual standard deviations for these. Moreover, we'll talk a little bit about smallest worthwhile changes, and we'll have to look at team average when we do so, but for future directions, it really becomes about the individual. It becomes about those, those athletes and those buckets that we've been talking about and trying to get out in front of what they're going to be experiencing using their prior experiences. Yeah, so working backwards can, of course, be a tricky task. It involves using clues to draw inferences while carefully navigating through your own biases because there's nothing that could be more detrimental than looking at something through one lens throughout the course of a season, knowing that that lens should be as adaptive as your environment is or you're only going to be accounting for those things that you previously thought you weighed heavy on. So with that being said, it's kind of, um, it's kind of interesting to go through and look back at the data in terms of weeks one through 11. So we get to that midpoint of the season and right off the bat, which one of these jumps out, it's gotta be that sleep quantity, right? So when we use absolute values in arbitrary benchmarks, like that smallest worthwhile change, they become useless when you're comparing between metrics, right? Cause if we're looking at sleep quantity in terms of hours, we get all the way up to eight hours at times from our guys. <clears throat> that would be a blessing. Uh, trying to run a linear regression through that or trying to make any qualitative analysis by pairing one of those um, one of those graphics with one that's on a subjective score or sliding scale becomes null and void. So we really got to avoid using that numbers on a page. Um, <laughs> we've got to use avoid using that numbers on a page outlook and add some statistical inferences to make things easier to pick out your significant events. If you can't identify and flag these significant events and trends, then you're really just going to be chasing your own biases throughout the season and kind of looking at things through one lens without any inferences. This will skew your qualitative analysis. You'll start to fish for numbers and results. Um, so as you can see here, we got our fatigue and soreness in those arbitrary units. Um, that seven point scale that we talked about earlier with the negatives being um, negative scores, of course, zero being neutral. If we throw those over individual standard deviations and then average those individual standard deviations across the team, you start to see you can make a little bit more inferences than you could originally with those arbitrary units. So what gets really interesting for me here is that week one, you know, you see fatigue is within expected values, um, about 0.5 standard, half the standard deviation below their individual average. But soreness, of course, when we start our training is well outside the predicted, uh, well outside the accepted averages or ranges. That starts to invert as, you know, we adapt to those stresses and fatigue climbs when we start to work, work towards, you know, higher practice volume and even getting into academics in the beginning of the season there. But it's, it's funny that once we get to the point where we're at that mid-season break, you see that flips where soreness is now at a level at a level that's you know within accepted values because we've adapted to the stresses of the season thus far but fatigue drops when we start looking into exam weeks um the <clears throat> the kind of overwhelming overbearing monotony of practice that starts to creep up on the guys when they really you know, start to start to get that stuff biting back at them. Um, so without statistical inferences, we're kind of looking at what's called a G whiz graph. I adopted this from a book, How to Lie with, with Statistics by Daryl Huff in 1954. It's a great book, excellent read. I think I bought it for like six bucks. I would highly suggest it to anyone who's interested in 
and sports science and the statistics side of things. But it's all about looking at your own biases and taking an objective approach and figuring out, you know, what I could be doing better. Um, it's not what you say or how you say it. And conveying information with different frames of reference is compelling, but also unethical. If you just look at numbers on a page with no inferences, then, and let's be honest, we're all guilty of it. You know, you can move a graph around to make it say whatever you want, right? Where we have our min and max values set to arbitrary thresholds. And we can kind of finagle that until a trend starts to arise as we have in that third picture there. Um, so something to keep in mind. And again, we've harped on this now. Environments change, so your model has to be adaptive. Fatigue and soreness, though related, aren't linearly, uh, do not have that linear relationship. Um, that's where that, those hidden layers come in, where those multiple instances where uh, maybe you know, certain interventions were done early on in the season that weren't adhered to by the end of the season, or maybe certain habits kind of go by the wayside sleep quantity drops off, um, <clears throat> things of that nature. And again, practice density. When that starts to ramp up, or game density, when that starts to ramp up, that's when things really start to go to shit. Um, sleep quality and quantity, of course, they do display relative linearity, but it seems to be regardless of that training effect. So basic human needs like sleep remain constant. It's not one of those things that, um, it's not one of those things that are, that it can just be put into a training program, right? So you know that regardless of what you're getting your guys through on the field, they're going to have to get to sleep. So that's one of those things that's, that's pretty non-binary. It's not black and white, but um, will actually stay constant throughout the season. So where it gets interesting is avoiding your knee-jerk reactions. So some background info on that week five. So first week of season or second week of academics, right? So you, everyone knows your first week of academics is kind of your syllabus week. It's kind of show up, shake hands with the professor, and you're out. Uh, second week is really where they start to hit you. Uh, immediate re knee-jerk reaction was to incentivize sleep time. That's where we started to get a little bit of what I believe was erroneous reporting. Um, and then also compounded on top of that, we had that second week of academics ramp up. You increase your screen time at night and your sleep quality um, doesn't really, uh, sorry, doesn't follow true with that. So those are some things you got to consider too, is what am I doing to change the environment with, with my team, with my athletes? How are my interventions causing these these numbers that I'm seeing or is the lack of intervention allowing things to slide so that's where I talk a little bit about want to talk a little bit about opportunity cost right so you can opportunity you can calculate your opportunity cost by looking at the loss of your potential gain from your next highest valued resource when choosing one option so the idea here is that any intervention that you you implement you want to limit that cost so that the highest valued option is chosen without sacrificing too much from your next available alternatives. A good example of this would be, you know, if we're going to limit practice duration so that our guys can get back to the dorms in time to get some homework done and then hopefully get to sleep earlier in an attempt to raise our sleep quantities and thus drop our soreness, then we got to know that in the latter portions of the season, when normally our guys have adapted to these increases in soreness because we pushed them so high in the beginning. We might, that might come back to haunt us, right? When the gain density starts to tick up, but is that opportunity cost worth spending when, you know, you're trying to build a program in the beginning, early phases of each season, that's just an, a uh, decision that you'll have to come to. Another, another bias that you need to be, aware of would be survivorship bias. We all know of this one by now. Um, so you got to analyze data based off not only what values you do have, but what you don't have, because it's just as important. Uh, prime example of this, World War II, you know, mechanics for the B-52 bombers, uh, they were coming back um, 
from not being shot down over the field. And they're trying to figure out, you know, why is it, you know, why is it that these planes survive when the others don't? They're taking a look at the bullet holes and everywhere that's riddled, they started to armor, right? Well, opportunity cost became high because it weighs the play down, but, you know, they're still getting the same results um, for some time after that of planes getting shot down until somebody started to realize, you know, hey, maybe the ones that are coming back are doing so because they're not getting shot in these high, um, <clears throat> high risk areas, such as the cockpit and engine. So we should start to armor where there aren't bullet holes as opposed to where they are. So that example just kind of lays into, you know, instead of trying to add some things in, some interventions like say additional recovery session to a training regimen because fatigue is high, try finding any other high confounding attributes that your survivors display, right? So where we talked about earlier, you know, <clears throat> those two guys, those upperclassmen that reported average levels of fatigue but had some of the highest soreness levels on the team well maybe that's because they've been you know they've been exposed to those high stressors for so long at that four-year point already so that's why they can actually you know adhere to those high levels of stress without having anything above average levels of fatigue uh, so in closing you know, all outcomes are subject to chance. Sir Isaac Newton, he was really the first guy to sit down and look at multiple variables and say, or multiple outcomes in an experiment and say, hey, maybe I should take these all together, average them out, find the middle ground, and that's where I should draw my outcomes from. Because prior to him, science was really just, you know, spin, the t spin a top five times, uh, trying to see how long it spins for you know, and whatever number you like is kind of in the middle and rounds to an even number, that's what we'll call, you know, that's what we'll call the duration of a top spinning. But even he, you know, the smartest man of his time and possibly ever was a devout Christian and thought it was a large part of his observations were the workings of God. He himself thought that these casual relationships needed divine intervention to be explained. So it only makes sense that we, you know, fact check our own biases and see that, you know, sometimes as, uh, as patterns emerge, as significant events start to become more regular, we need to understand that there are no absolutes and that these things might be happening due to, you know, pure chance or even some confounding variables that we haven't really touched on yet at this point. So without any further ado, I believe uh, that's all I have. Tonight, I want to thank you guys for signing on. Um, we'll have some other ones soon coming up here, hosted by Strength to Speed, and then we'll see, uh, we'll see what we can get going out of that. Uh, <clears throat> I'll send out an email with these slides to everybody, and uh, you guys are more than welcome to, to hang on to those. Uh, we'd ask that you don't share them, of course, um, unless uh, given permission to do so. But, yeah, definitely have, have – um, have your own models examined, get your multiple regressions ready. And uh, if you have any questions on how to actually perform those, I can definitely, you know, hop on an email chain with you and explain. There's some pretty simple uh, applications that you can add on to. Um, not everyone needs to code in R. You can get data analysis tool packs for Excel. Um, <clears throat> StatKey is a website that does it. Uh, there's plenty of easy ways to get to get around it if you don't have the time to devote to learning how to code and really digging into that but yep so that's it for me again email me if you have any questions cheers